There are over 35,000 museums within the United States, welcoming over 850 million visitors each year. Did you ever wonder what goes on behind the scenes in museums, creating the displays and exhibits we all enjoy? Join us as we explore museums and their exhibits from the inside out. Hi, I'm Leslie Mueller. Welcome to Museum Access, the show that takes you to America's top museums to talk to the experts. Then we go behind the scenes to learn even more. We're in the heart of beautiful St. Petersburg, Florida at the breathtaking Dali Museum, home to the largest collection of Salvador Dali works outside of Europe. We all know the Dali surrealist painter with superb technical skills and striking yet sometimes bizarre images. But did you know that his artistic creativity was firmly based in his love of science and mathematics? Today, we're going to learn more about this complicated man through his artwork. We'll see his work in a completely new way using augmented reality technology. We'll even see the master himself come to life through cutting edge artificial technology. And I'll bet you didn't know that Dolly designed jewelry. We'll go behind the scenes into the museum's private preparation room to see a collection of his dazzling designs that are rarely on view to the public. And we also have another surprise there. So are you ready to see the world through the eyes of Salvador Dali? Let's go. Greetings. I am Salvador Felipe Jacinto Dali y Domenech. And I am back. Hank, you have to tell me about this incredible museum. First of all, this building. This is unreal. The building is uh, itself a work of art, uh, just like the works of Salvador Dali that it houses. Uh, it was designed by H.O.K. Uh, and the chief designer was Jan Weymouth, who had been the chief designer on the Louvre under I.M. Pei oh, and the well, National Gallery. Look similar. Yes, well, wow. well this dome actually uh, was at the request of one of our founders. Uh, she liked the fact that in Spain, Dali's museum has a geodesic dome. Oh. And we thought, well, we'll make a geodesic dome, but it has to be much more Dalinian than that. And so it's been morphed by a computer so that every one of the thousand plus uh, triangles of glass is a different shape. It's a different angle, different size. And so uh, it's really much like uh, what art does for you to stand here as we are and look out because every frame of the triangle gives frames a different vision of the world. And so uh, that's really the lesson for us of what art does is it gives you a new perspective on yourself, on the world and on your own possibilities. Well, I also felt that when you're standing outside, it looks like the building is moving. There's so much movement, it doesn't look static. No, it doesn't. It, it's got a very uh, firm orthogonal uh, elements. Yes. You know, it's geometric, it's a big uh, rectangle. But then it has these elements that are bursting out as though uh, we propose to the architect, what would this building look like if the energy of the art suddenly broke through the walls? And, and this is what he came up with. Oh, we're, we're delighted. It's wonderful. Let's talk about the beginning of the museum. Can we sure. talk about that? Yeah, yeah. The, the Dali Museum collection uh, that we now display today uh, began as a private collection in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, started by an industrialist, Reynolds Morris, and his wife, Eleanor. And they put together over four decades this preeminent collection of Dali's work because they collected only Dali. And they became personal friends with Dali. It was a kind of love affair. Yeah. And they uh, met Gala, Dali's wife, and Dali, and they traveled together. Each year they would visit. And they had their pick from the early 40s until the 70s of the best Dollies in the world, and they bought them, and they used their their small fortune to buy only Dolly, and that's how they created this great collection. We have since added to it, mm -hmm. but th that is the core of our collection. 
most museums will have the work of an artist like Dali only at a specific moment sure. that fits into the story of modern art. Right. Uh, whereas we follow that artist from when he was copying the Impressionists and the Faubists and the Cubists to his own vision and surrealism to something that was postmodern, and we can see the whole arc of his imagination. Tell me about that garden. I saw a beautiful garden out there. It's a beautiful garden. We call it the Avant Garden. Oh. <laughs> so Dali was part of the Avant Garde. This is the Avant Garden. And it contains um, uh, both Mediterranean plants that Dali would have seen oh. and subtropical plants characteristic of, of our region. It also reflects uh, Dali's uh, duality, which is that he was classically trained but then he presents a world that's unreal. Well, I think, you know, he uses that dichotomy to uh, reorient us, you know? So if he can paint exactingly enough so that you believe that you're seeing a real object and in real space, but then he creates an object and a space that's not real, then he puts you in another dimension. Yeah. And really, this is the mechanism of surrealism. The idea is that present something that is completely disorienting, you know, a clock that is not rigid and firm, yes, right. but melts. What it does psychologically is it throws you for a loop for a second. It's so though that your, your psychological ground dropped away mm -hmm. and suddenly you find yourself as a body in space. But very quickly you come back uh, to yourself, but maybe with a slight reorientation. Sure. And, and that's the mechanism of surrealism to startle you and then create a new reality internally. I saw a bunch of very enthusiastic children running into one of the rooms downstairs. Tell me what they were doing. Ah, so you saw I was the jealous actually. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they get to do really fun yeah, things. It was fun. You saw the kids going into our junior docent program. Okay. And in that program, they, they do make art, but largely they're learning to speak about how they feel about art. So for me, it's a class not only in art history and in crafts, but in citizenship, because they learn to stand in front of their peers oh. and say, here is this painting, I like it for these reasons, or I dislike it for these reasons, and here is what the artist is trying to achieve. So they are presenting their own unique view of the world in this, and they're coached by, uh, you know, uh, public school teachers who are versed in, in this and uh, given uh, a vocabulary to express themselves. Now tell me more about the community. I mean, I'm assuming the community, the children come in for classes. What other types of programs? Well, we bring in kids from the schools okay. for docent oh. tours. Okay. We have classes for adults. Oh. We have adult docents. So we, we, we have lectures, films, performances, and classes here. Then we also have something that's absolutely unique in the nation, and that is an innovation laboratory. Oh. And we use uh, the works of Dali, his methodology of working, mm -hmm. and we use that to spur creative problem solving. And this is something we offer to businesses. Yeah, I was gonna say. To institutions yeah. and to individuals. That should uh, be a corporate workshop. It's exa yeah. exactly that, yes. a child, do you think? So one of the things about Dolly's childhood is that he, of course, was born into the age of cinema. 
He was born into the age of Jules Verne. He was fascinated by science and fascinated by science fiction and just the whole experience of seeing the world through a kind of technological lens. At the same time, he found that he was very gifted as an artist. He was encouraged by his parents to pursue his interest in the arts. Oh, nice. And so every summer when they would go to Katakas where they had a summer house, that's where he discovered his love of painting and originally starting as an impressionist, training himself, looking at other paintings and trying to learn how to do that. Wow. He became aware particularly of Jean Miro. Oh. So Miro was a, another Catalan. He was 13 years older than Dali and he saw his work and became very fascinated by it. So he goes through as a student a very unique um, experience of painting in two to three different styles simultaneously. So Cubism and Baroque Spanish uh, style. style. Yeah. And eventually once he really perfects the Baroque Spanish, it allows him to go into a very avant-garde, what he calls an anti-art period. And that's where he falls under the, the spell of Miro. And then two years later, he goes to Paris, introduced to the Surrealists and becomes a member of the group. So probably one of the very best works from his early years is a painting called Catechez, which shows his ambition, both the influence of Picasso and people like Andre Durand and um, Paul Cezanne, and also the sense of his homeland, his love of his landscape. And then the other piece from that early period that really shows what he accomplished is Basket of Bread, because Basket of Bread was for Dali a kind of an opportunity to shine to prove to everybody that he had arrived as a great painter. After that work was done, he moves on into some very abstract work. And that's where pieces like Apparatus in Hand and, uh, you know, um, Big Thumb, Plate Moon and Decaying Bird, those paintings are so different than Basket of Bread. So let's talk about Dali and his early relationship with the Surrealists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Dali was younger than the people we associate with Surrealism. You know, it started in 1924 in Paris. Dali was just a student in, uh, in Madrid, but he was very aware of it. And the big connection between Dali and what would be the Surrealists in the future was his, um, what he calls the vice of self-interpretation. Mm -hmm. He fell under the spell of Sigmund Freud and he read everything he could that was translated into Spanish. And so he was thinking in a kind of parallel way with what the Surrealists in Paris were thinking. So by 1929, his friend Louis Bunuel, who had wanted to become a filmmaker, yeah. suggested the idea, let's make a film. And they made the movie, The Andalusian Dog, Ancien Andalou, and it revolutionized cinema and it led the Surrealists to suddenly become very aware of both of these new artists from Spain. And by November of that year, he was invited to have a show in Paris and was officially a member of the group. I want to talk about masterpieces. Okay. Explain what a masterpiece is exactly. So we have, um, we have eight large canvases in our collection. And our collector, Reynolds Morris, came up with a term called the Dolly Masterwork. And a masterwork is a piece from his definition. It took Dolly approximately a year to paint, you know, to come up with, to generate the idea and then complete the piece. They're at least five feet or more in one or more directions. And for example, the one behind us here, it's 12 feet tall. And for Dolly, these would be opportunities to summarize a year. So he would paint one of these works almost each year. That's sort of the pattern. So for over about two decades, he came up with anywhere from 18 to 22, depending on whether or not you see that particular piece being part of it. But like it's a extraordinary. Personal journal. Yeah, exactly. The year. Exactly. It was a summation. And they're very narrative. They're very much telling stories. You know, Dolly's very interested in communicating the story of his obsessions that year. They're very representational, but they also have this, they're all about a dreamlike interpretation of the mm -hmm. particular topic. Uh, in our painting, in our collection, there's the Infanta Margarita, where Dolly pays homage to Velasquez. There is the um, Galaxy Dolacy Desoxy Ribonucleic Acid. Say that fast five times. That's right. Where he's, you know, and he was very impressed by that title. Oh, I'm sure. Dolly, Dolly made he sure nobody that. missed that it was the longest title he had ever created. That was his curse for future curators. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And he misspelled it too. That's the best oh, part. Perfect. Yes. So forever there's a, though, yeah. Right? Well, he was a bad speller. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so we have to always put the SIC after it. a question. I mean, there is a lot of symbolism in what Dali does, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, 
did he write down what these symbols meant on everything, or is it are they educated much, guesses in some? It, it's extraordinary. So Dolly wrote almost as much as he painted. Oh. He was very much a storyteller. And when he was 36 years old, he wrote a 400 page autobiography. Huh. It's this extraordinary book. And the most important thing to know about Dolly is when he shares stories about his life, he uses hyperbole and lies. And so he creates, takes a kernel of something that's interesting and twists it around until it becomes much more fantastic. You know, and, and he had a quote that I think really helps to understand this. He said, facts are like jewels. It's the false ones that shine the brightest. So one of the things that worked really well for us was augmented reality. And we took eight of our large canvases and we basically turned them into visual films where using a, an iPad, well actually using our app, which is where we have these eight short experiences um, available, you know, so through our free app, you're able to go to any one of these paintings, either in reproduction or in person. So you oh. can do it just looking on the on your computer and holding up your camera. Once it falls into the right space, mm -hmm. it locks on it and creates uh, about a 30 second to one minute movie where you can actually see the painting come to life. It transforms. And we were able to bring out different details that you might miss otherwise. You know, Dolly would have loved that. Oh, my God. I mean, yes. I can't believe, yes. I can't believe he didn't live to see that. Well, all through the 60s and 70s, he talked about holograms and computers. And he just had this kind of fascination with um, science fiction uh, technology. Sure. Gets back to that. And yeah. so now here we are, you know, in the 21st century, and a lot of these ideas that he had that seem so far out and crazy are absolutely what we're using to educate and entertain. Greetings. I am Salvador Felipe Jacinto Dali y Domenech. And I am back. Well, I know you have Dali Lives. Right. And it seems like it's a hologram, but I know there's artificial intelligence involved in that. Tell us what that's all about. Yeah, so Dolly Lives is such an uh, extraordinary opportunity for us because for you know 30 years we were here talking about an artist where you don't really see him. Everything is an object that he created, but we never really get to see the artist. So suddenly through AI, we had this opportunity to bring Dolly to life. And it's extraordinary. It was um, a company in San Francisco, Goodby Silverstein and Partners. And we sent them hundreds of interviews with Dolly, quotes by Dolly, film footage that he was in. You got to see him uh, suddenly turned into a real person who was sharing with the public ideas about his art, they were able to hear how he spoke, kind of saw some of his mannerisms, and it's extraordinary. Now, suddenly, Dolly is here in the Dolly Museum. Allison, I know this is your domain. Can you tell me what goes on in the preparation area? Sure, this is where we bring the pieces that we're going to put on exhibition upstairs oh. um, into this room to make sure that they are properly mounted, that the frames are um, looking right, that nothing needs to be rematted. Uh, maybe new glass or plexiglass might need to go on. So we make sure everything is perfect. We install hardware here. So this is the last place that the art comes before we then bring it upstairs to hang it in the galleries. You know, I think most of us just think it just comes from, you know, a shelf and you just go hang it on the wall. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot more There's involved, a process to there? it. Wow. There is, yeah. Now, I know that uh, Peter was talking about all the different areas that uh, Salvador Dali got involved with. What do we have in front of us here? This is incredible. <laughs> this is a, our a selection of our jewels that we have from the Morses who uh, were the collectors that we have that we show here upstairs. Mm -hmm. um, and these, this is just a fraction of what we got, but I wanted to um, talk about a little bit about some details of these today yes, with you. Yes, thank you for sharing sure. these because I know these are rarely on view. But wow, Dolly loved the idea of luxury, and to him, the things that were most luxurious were the things that were useless, which <laughs> he viewed jewelry as not a useful object. It's some. But you and well, I might think that, opinion. correct. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he first conceived these these jewels as um, they were larger and less functional than what we see now, he, and he made them as more art objects. And and then and that was back in the 1930s. And then he um, 
in the 1940s and 50s, he started working with a jeweler called Alemani and Company out of New York City. Hmm. And Eleanor Moore so loved these objects that Dolly had made that she asked them to make a more wearable versions of those of those jewels. Oh. So not not objects, but pieces that she could wear, and she did wear them often to the opera. Um, she, she, yeah, this is from her the personal baubles. collection, yes. Oh my gosh, mm -hmm. well let's get a little more specific mm -hmm. here. So you'll see um, the telephone motif repeated in several of Dolly's paintings, especially the lobster telephone, which is a useless object. Not as luxurious as this pin, but we do see this telephone here with an emerald and a ruby. And we've got Stunning. a bit of, I'll move it here, a bit of a, a, it's dripping. It's maybe melting a little bit. This is a take on his iconic um, painting, The Persistence of Memory. Um, and this you'll see is a, a pin, a brooch. Gosh. In the original, there was actually a little door that opened and had a real operating clock inside. So it was a, a useful object inside of a useless object. Yeah. So it's very <laughs> exactly. Dalinian. Yeah, so. exactly. Yep. This piece was inspired by the 12th century legend of Tristan and Isolde, which is, um, speaks about sh chivalric romance. He has taken it here and, and, and used the classic illusion of the hidden goblet. So you see two faces looking at each other and the negative space then creates a goblet shape. Oh, wow. Well, Dolly has just taken this goblet and brought it out of its negative space, adorned it with diamonds, and gave it a ruby to suggest a glass of wine. This is our tree of life. Um, I guess it's an ensemble. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. There are earrings a necklace and a bracelet. Mm. And this was made just for Mrs. Morse. And you can imagine how, she she was a, a tiny woman, but look how that small this, yes, it's oh fit God. around her neck. Wow. Um, and this is from um, Daphne and Apollo, the, le the mythological legend. And uh, Apollo would pursue Daphne. She didn't want anything to do with him. She called to her <laughs> father for help and he turned her into a tree. Oh, so well, that, Dolly loved that so metamorph. <laughs> And so that was, uh, Dolly was preoccupied with that metamorphosis. That's one of a, a principle that he would apply to a lot of his work. We, yeah. Now we see this further morphed into uh, a wearable object of beauty. Uh, the leaves are from the, from the tree of life. Um, it does it, to me, it looks like it might poke you quite a lot. If you if well, you're wearing snag, this everything out, everything you're wearing, exactly. Yeah. No I mean, nits. You have to be very careful. No nits. No nits. Yeah, no nits for Mrs. Morris no. when she was wearing this. <laughs> she was getting enough compliments, though. That yeah. I'm sure it made up <laughs> for any of the challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Shana, what do we have on the table here already? It looks like a beautiful little landscape. Yeah, here we have one of Dolly's earliest oils. We're thinking somewhere between 1910 and 1914. Oh my gosh. He would have been six to 10 years old. It's not fair that a child that young can paint like this. I look at this painting often and then I look at stuff that I've created from that age yeah, and what I'm thinking. it's it's very clear that Dolly had talent from such an early age absolutely very clear now where did he get materials I mean were his parents encouraging it or his parents realized that at a young age around this age because this isn't the only one there's about um, five similar pieces so they learned at an early an early age yeah. of his that he had some talent. So they ended up enrolling him in a special school that would have art classes. So this is where he began to learn about watercolors. And then a little later on is when he was introduced to oils, the medium of oil. In fact, he set up his first studio, artist studio, in 1912. So he would have been eight years old. Oh my gosh. And he's overlooking the landscape outside of Figueres. And this is like where you see Dali's lifelong passion for the Spanish landscape. 
um, his attention to detail. If you look, you see birds, the houses with the pink roofs, everything is just so vibrant. So a child being this attuned to nature at yeah. that age is, is truly incredible. But it looks like it was, I mean, is it on paper? What is it painted on? This is a postcard. Oh so back then How we're in the, survive? I know, and it's almost, it's an impeccable condition. So over a hundred years old. Um, and now, the oil wouldn't, would the oil absorb into the cardboard? Or no, it, it, it has not. Surface? It has sat on the surface. Wow. So, um, this piece was actually originally in his wife's ex-husband collection and through the custodial... Wait a minute. Yes. His wife's first husband's collection? Yes. There's a story there. I know. <laughs> and we... You haven't figured it out, huh? No, we have not. Um, <laughs> but this was given to us in 2004 by... Dolly's unofficial archivist, Albert Field. So this is a very special piece in our collection. It's rarely on view because of the age sure. and because it's on a postcard. Well, I mean, the fragility of a piece like that yes. is what, I mean, as conservators, you have to just be careful yes. with everything. Especially you're, you're with the lights. Guardians of these pieces of culture. Mm -hmm. And if you weren't there to do it, I don't know who would. No, and I always think 50 to 100 years from now, will this piece still be in this impeccable condition? So Let's pray. generations in the future yeah. can enjoy this piece. Salvador Dali was an original, yet he was influenced by many artistic styles from classical to avant-garde. He studied, reinterpreted, found inspiration, and made art that was uniquely his own. He once said, a true painter is one who can paint extraordinary scenes in the middle of an empty desert. Extraordinary scenes indeed, from an extraordinary artist. Thanks for joining us on Museum Access, where every visit is an adventure. I'm Leslie Mueller. See you next time. Before you leave, you will take a picture with me? Sure. Yeah. Alor. Uno. Dos. Tres. Ooh la la.